Hey everyone, and welcome to the Five Bytes Podcast. I'm your host, Rory Monahan, and the podcast, as always, is brought to you by my sponsors. That includes Numescent, the inventors of the first and only cloud native container management platform for Windows desktops. And also brought to you by Master Packager, an application packaging software that helps you build packages that end users love, enterprises want, and the Windows OS needs. If you enjoy the show each week, you have these awesome sponsors to thank. And now for some news. BleepyComputer.com has reported that Microsoft have confirmed a critical Windows 11 24H2 bug that causes the File Explorer, Start Menu, and other key system components to crash when provisioning systems with cumulative updates released since July 2025. So, been going on for quite a while. I saw Neowin.net essentially reported this story stating that Microsoft has finally admitted that almost all core Windows 11 features haven't been working outright. And it's indicated that this impacts non-persistent desktops more so than traditional persistent desktops. This bug will be triggered on first-time user logon after a cumulative update was applied and on all logons for those using non-persistent operating systems, which makes sense if it's happening on that first login. It's probably uh, interpreting on a non-persistent as always being the first login in some uh, regard. What happens after the login is that app packages, some of those app X packages, must reinstall each session. On impacted systems, it causes issues for multiple essential Windows 11 shell components when XAML dependency packages fail to register properly after updates. As Microsoft explained in a recent support document, applications that depend on these types of packages aren't registering in time after an update is installed, a timing issue that cascades then through the system, preventing critical interface components from initializing properly. This causes shell components such as explorer.startmenu, experience host, and shellhost.exe to crash with visible errors or fail silently, leaving users with partially functional systems that cannot display various navigation tools. Affected users can experience a wide range of problems, including start menu crashes, missing taskbars, the core shell host system process crashing, and the settings app silently failing to launch. In response, Microsoft has provided some AppX install commandlets that they recommend those being affected by this issue, so particularly those on non-persistent desktops, to run at login. So uh, you probably want to put this in uh, part of your login script, or if you're using some sort of environment manager, maybe look at uh, running these commandlets with those tools. Hopefully there's going to be a better permanent fix soon. Microsoft has warned IT admins to prepare for the removal of WINS, which is Windows Internet Name Service, from Windows Server releases starting in November 2034. So getting a good long run at freeing yourself from the use of WINS. The legacy WINS Computer Name Registration and Resolution Service has been deprecated with the release of Windows Server 2022 uh, since August 2021, when Microsoft stopped active development and working on new features. Windows Server 2025 will be the final long-term servicing channel release to come with WINS support, with the feature to be removed from future releases. According to bleepycomputer.com, organizations still relying on WINS are encouraged to migrate to modern DNS-based name resolution before then. And yeah, um, while uh, obviously DNS is pretty much ubiquitous with computer-to-computer communication and the internet and all types of connected services, and you might think that, ah, you know, our organization's been using DNS for so many years, we probably don't have a reliance on WINS. You should really check to make sure. Um, I've worked in multiple organizations Uh, that had been around for like decades and there was still a reliance on wins for some legacy applications so you should really make doubly sure microsoft has released a kb5072753 out of band cumulative update to fix a known issue causing the november 2025 kb5068966 hot patch update to reinstall on windows 11 systems repeatedly Microsoft said about this that, quote, if you have not yet deployed the November 2025 hot patch update KB5068966, 
966 on Windows 11 version 25H2 devices in your environment. You, we recommend you apply this out-of-band update KB5072753 instead. In some good news for Windows 11, Microsoft is testing a new optional feature that preloads File Explorer in the background to improve launch times and performance on Windows 11 systems. According to Microsoft, the application will load automatically once the feature is toggled on without visible changes to users, who should only notice faster File Explorer launches when accessing files and folders. Considering File Explorer is pretty much used by everyone multiple times, many times throughout the day with most workflows on Windows, it probably makes sense to preload it in this way and save those valuable seconds throughout the day. I didn't cover absolutely everything announced during Ignite last week because it would take far too long, but I figured it's worth highlighting that Microsoft have announced Sysmon will be added to Windows 11 in early 2026. It is hoped that it will make it easier for security teams to detect and respond to threats by having it accessible on every Windows 11 system in an estate. WindowsCentral.com has reported that Microsoft have published a feature to Windows Insiders that lets users uninstall store-managed apps from the Microsoft Store's library page. So this is kind of a nice or a nicer looking. Um, UI for uninstalling and managing applications than, say, the apps and features uh, menu within the uh, Windows 11 settings. Neowin.net has reported that a new Power Toys feature is in the works that allows you to tweak multiple monitor settings. The screenshot shared on Twitter by developers shows the ability to change things like contrast and brightness for each individual monitor via a single window. Rather cool is also that Power Toys may soon get a new webcam utility that can help you look better during calls by placing a ring of light on your monitor. BleepyComputer.com has reported that Grafana Labs is warning of a maximum severity vulnerability, CVE-2025-41115, in its enterprise products that could be exploited to treat new users as admins or for privilege escalation. The issue is only exploitable when SCIM, which is System for Cross-Domain Identity Management, provisioning is enabled and configured. It looks like Grafana have given this one a 10 on the severity scale, thus it being called a maximum severity vulnerability. Administrators of self-managed installations can address the risk by applying uh, some of the updates, which will be Grafana Enterprise version 12.3.0, uh, 12.2.1, 12.1.3, or 12.0.6, respectively, depending on what, I guess, uh, rev you're on currently. I know Grafana is used quite widely uh, for some just internal uh, monitoring and uh, data display capabilities, and I'm pretty sure it's integrated by some vendors as well, so... Hopefully people are on top of this. Ars Technica has reported that Dell and HP have disabled HEVC hardware decoding in some of their laptops, resulting in certain video content not playing in browsers on these devices, forcing users to use a third-party media player. HP reportedly disabled the codec in certain models all the way back in 2024. HP and Dell shared comments with Ars Technica, but neither of the uh, comments addresses the reason why this was disabled by the vendors. But interestingly, last year Synology announced that it was also ending support for HEVC, as well as H.264 slash AVC and VCI on its Disk Station Manager and B Station OS platforms, saying that support for video codecs is widespread on end devices such as smartphones, tablets, computers, and smart TVs. And they said, quote, this update reduces unnecessary resource usage on the server and significantly improves media processing efficiency. The optimization is particularly effective in high user environments compared to traditional server-side processing, end quote. Well, all that to say it's probably uh, coming down to cost is my guess, and it's probably one less complication or um, variable that they have to consider in their development and support. It's my guess. Speaking of Dell, Dell has predicted PC sales will be flat next year, despite the potential of the AI PC 
and the slow replacement of Windows 10, stating, quote, We have not completed the Windows 11 transition. In fact, if you were to look at it relative to the previous OS end of support, we are 10 to 12 points behind at that point with Windows 11 than we were in the previous generation, end quote. Dell COO Jeffrey Clark said that means 500 million PCs can't run Windows 11, while the same number didn't need an upgrade to handle Microsoft's latest desktop OS. The COO therefore predicted the PC market will flourish, but then defined the word as meaning roughly flat sales, despite Dell chalking up mid to high single digit PC sales growth over the last year. The Register.com suggests that Dell can survive flat PC growth because its enterprise AI hardware portfolio is booming. The company booked orders for $12.3 billion worth of AI servers in the quarter ended October 31st and shipped machines valued at $5.6 billion. Revenue from servers and networking kit reached $10.1 billion for the quarter, up 37% year over year. So a pretty good year for Dell, and I'd imagine that's the same for other hardware vendors too. Ars Technica has reported that the UK government will promise to buy emerging chip technology from British companies in a £100 million bid to boost growth by supporting the AI sector. Liz Kendall, the science secretary, said the government would offer guaranteed payments to British startups producing AI hardware that can help sectors such as life sciences and financial services. Under a first customer promise modeled on the way the government bought COVID vaccines, Kendall's department will commit in advance to buying AI inference chips that meet set performance standards. It's interesting, to me at least, because... It does make sense to invest in boosting their own sector rather than spending money on product from outside the UK. You know, you're taking money from your economy and bolstering someone else's economy. But at the same time, my immediate thought when seeing that about like COVID in this context is that I remember the various stories of corruption and waste during that time with politicians, friends being given fat contracts and returning very little as well. And I obviously heard the stories, uh, the many stories from the UK government at the time, which was a bit of a basket case. But we even had stories uh, from Ireland like that, where um, certain airlines were being contracted to um, fly in PPE. Uh, PPE was being rush ordered and it was of poor quality and that kind of thing. I mean, some of it is understandable, you know. Uh, you need to act fast in that situation, but at the same time, you know, follow the money and see who's getting these deals, and it's usually pretty dirty. Still, in this uh, story, I think it is the right thing to do. Uh, I think they should be investing into the British sector itself, and, you know, all companies, all regions, all states in the U.S. and stuff like that, they do this, Right. The idea of corporate socialism, you know, Ireland gets a hard time uh, because of our corporate tax rate. But in reality, you look at like Amazon a few years ago in New York State, we're paying zero. You know, they're all making these deals. I remember Nissan in the UK got like 80 billion pounds as an incentive to keep production there. So yeah, you know, the market rate of what they should be paying in tax is one thing. But in reality, when they're being given these massive rebates, you know, that's not what they're paying. And every country does it, some better than others. And in this story, I think it makes sense to keep that money circulating within the United Kingdom and to try and bolster uh, their own AI sector. Others should be doing so too. Ars Technica reported that one of the world's premier security organizations has canceled the results of its annual leadership election after an official lost an encryption key needed to unlock results stored in a verifiable and privacy-preserving voting system. The International Association of Cryptologic Research, or IACR, said that the votes were submitted and tallied using Helios, an open-source voting system that uses peer-reviewed cryptography to cast and count votes in a verifiable, confidential, and privacy-preserving way. Helios encrypts each vote in a way that assures each ballot is secret. Other cryptography used by Helios allows each voter to confirm their ballot was counted fairly. 
The loss of the encryption key has been called an honest but unfortunate human mistake. And to prevent a similar incident, the IACR will adopt a new mechanism for managing private keys. Instead of requiring all three chunks of private key material, elections will now require only two. Moti Young, the trustee who was unable to provide his third of the key material, uh, has resigned as a result of this. And a new election that started Friday uh, and runs through December 20th uh, will be taking place. It is unfortunate, but I think it's actually a pretty impressive system. It's good that they're keeping faith and they're just uh, rejigging things and doing it again, I think. Ars Technica has reported that during an all-hands meeting earlier this month, Google's AI infrastructure head, Amin Vahedad, told employees that the company must double its serving capacity every six months to meet demand for AI services. Major tech companies are now in a race to build out data centers, which I've covered on the podcast on previous episodes, and Google's competitor OpenAI is planning to build six massive data centers across the U.S. through its Stargate partnership project with SoftBank and Oracle, committing over $400 billion in the next three years to reach nearly 7 gigawatts of capacity. So it's no surprise that Google and other players in the AI space need to follow suit and they need to ramp up and get data centers built and just multiply the resources and the spend. Unfortunately, this is bad news for the planet and for humanity in general. I laugh, but it's not really a laughing matter, unfortunately. But now this episode's scripts, tricks, and tips. I will keep it short this week. It is Thanksgiving, so (laughs) it's probably going to be an episode that not all that many people listen to. Uh, But I would just like to highlight that the Cloud Paging User Group is going to be taking place uh, next week at the time of this recording on December 2nd. It will be held at 2.30 p.m. GMT time, which I believe is 9.30 a.m. Eastern time for those in the U.S. And it will feature a What's New with New Messant segment and it will also feature a public product roadmap session from Numescent CEO Arthur Hotomi. And I'll share a link uh, for the registration page if you'd like to attend that uh, with this episode. And you will find that over at 5 with episode 415. But as always, thank you all so much for listening. For those who celebrate, happy Thanksgiving, and I will catch you next week.